That was a beautiful uh, message and song. And we're going to take a look at some of those ancient words about 3,500 years ago that the Lord wrote us and gave us a message for us today. Before we begin, I want to offer a word of prayer. So if you'll join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to invite your Holy Spirit to be present with us that these words written so long ago might find life in our hearts. Jesus, you said that the words you spoke were spirit and life. Amen. Revive us, O God. We trust your words and we believe that we may experience a present blessing just now. In Christ's name, amen. So I have something I want to, uh, this is particularly for the children, but, and if they want to gather over here, I can, it's a little uh, illustration that will go along with the message. So you're welcome to come up here, because I have some questions to ask. What is this? A stick. Okay, and what's this? A stone or a rock. Okay, now, and what do we have here? Water, all right. What happens if I put this stick in the water? Will it, will it float or will it sink? Well, if it's full of water already, it'll sink, but it's not full of water already. I guess it depends on the stick, too. Um, but what do you think it's going to do if I put it there? It's going to float. You know that for certain? You know, for like, you, 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 would, you would lay your life on the line for this. Yes? You guys, you don't trust the properties of nature, huh? No, this is, this is a branch. There's nothing, there's no, uh, there's no lies going on here. There's not, there's not, it's not lead, it, lead, filled with lead or anything. So this is a branch. So let's, let's find out. It's floating. It's floating. What about this rock? What do you think it's going to do? It's going to sink. Would you trust your life with that? If someone said, if this, if this floats, that's it for you. <laughs> Would you still say it's going to sink? It sank. How, how did you know? You never saw me put this in there before. How, how did you know it was going to float? Because it's heavier? They actually probably weigh about the same. One is, well, one is less dense. One is less dense. So there's something about the properties or the nature of the items that you knew prior to me putting them in there. You knew what was going to happen. So listen to the message, and we're going to see that illustrated in the spiritual life. All right. What manner of persons. In Psalm verse 50, 3 to 6, we read, Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Amen. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Amen. Time on this earth is short. This earth is waxing old like a garment. The increasing intensity and occurrences of disasters in nature, the political unrest, the wars and rumors of wars, the acceptance of moral depravity as normal in our society and the Laodicean condition of his own people all point to the culmination of events, to the great consummation. And these words are more true today than when I had originally prepared this message some years back. The protections of the Constitution are being repudiated to a large degree. The law of God, that great standard of righteousness by which all are to, to live, has been disregarded by the majority of the world, 
and the majority of Christendom as well. And this disregard for the great law of Jehovah has brought about a disregard for the supreme law of our land. In Isaiah 59, verses 14 to 15, we read these words. I believe this, I believe this is a prophecy for today. Judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. Or another rendering in the margin is, or is accounted mad. To depart from evil, to follow the standard of righteousness, is to make yourself a prey. You will be verbally attacked, your character will be questioned, and you will be looked upon as a madman. Jesus said the world will hate you. Why? Because it hated him. And why did the world hate Jesus? Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. John 7, 7. This is a quote from Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 289. We, we read in the pen of inspiration, there are many in the church who are at, at heart belong to the world. But God calls upon those who claim to believe the advanced truth to rise above the present attitude of the popular churches of today. Where is the self-denial? Where is the cross-bearing that Christ has said should characterize his followers? That is, where are those who have made a covenant by sacrifice? The reason we have had so little influence upon unbelieving relatives and associates is that we have manifested little decided difference in our practices from those of the world. When we reach the standard that the Lord would have us reach, worldlings will regard Seventh-day Adventists as odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. We are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Amen. Do you claim to believe the advanced truth? Are you ready to be called a fanatic, mostly behind your back? Are you ready to experience derision and to be shunned by the world and even by your own brethren, your own family? Are, are we ready to be Seventh-day Adventists? Not when its praises are sung, but when it becomes the most maligned name of all. Seventh day means that I believe in the perpetuity of God's law. Amen. I believe that God's law is eternal, that it is the foundation of his kingdom. It is the standard of righteousness which all citizens of heaven must and will have. It is the character of God himself. Seventh day particularly points to the Sabbath of creation, the seventh day of the week commonly called Saturday. As a Seventh-day Adventist, I serve God and not man. I worship according to his commandment, not the commandments of men. I acknowledge Jehovah as Lord and as Creator. And I believe in the power of his word to accomplish his works. Amen. The Bible and not tradition is where I stand. Adventist means that I believe in the second advent or coming of Jesus Christ. But it's more than that. There are others who believe the same, but are not Adventists. With my understanding of Bible prophecy, I believe in the imminent or soon return of Jesus. That is, I believe that it will take place in my lifetime. Revelation 10.6 states that there shall be time no longer. Prior to October 22, 1844, prophecy did not allow for the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
But after the passing of the time, of this the longest and last of all time prophecies, we no longer wait for time to be fulfilled. What do we wait for then? This is James 5, 7, and we've looked at this uh, earlier this week. 5, 7, and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Again, this patience, this word comes up. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. This is one of the characters of God that we are emulating. Be ye also patient as he is. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. It is not time we wait for, but fruit. And it's not so much we that wait for the coming of the Lord, but it's the Lord who waits for us to receive the rain that we might bear fruit. And as such, we must live in preparation for that event, seeking the righteousness of character, which we must have in order to see God. I look not forward to death and resurrection, but rather I look forward to translation. To be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, for this corruptible to put on incorruption, this mortal to put, to put on immortality, I am an Adventist. And I not only look forward to seeing the heavens unrolled like a scroll to see my Savior come, but I seek to hasten that day by how I live. What manner of persons ought ye to be? This is what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. But is it what the reality is? Revelation chapter 3 declares us the message of the true and faithful witness. Jesus knows our works. He describes with pinpoint accuracy our condition as a people, as Seventh-day Adventists. Poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. The Old Testament gives us message after message of prophetic warning describing the condition of God's people in the very end of time. In Ezekiel 9.4, the Bible says, speaking of the uh, sealing time, the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So I already said what it was, but what, what time? What time is this talking of? The sealing time, yes. If we look at verse 4 again here, where are these abominations being done? Jerusalem. This is not speaking of the world. And when is the sealing time? Where, when does that happen? At the end. God knew his people. He knew what Seventh-day Adventists would become. Idolatry, pride, self-righteousness, the love of dress, the love of pleasure, licentiousness, the desecration of God's temple, things unspeakable, all these things are being done in Jerusalem, the place where God has placed his name, and they are being done during the sealing time. Isaiah 33, 14, it says, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Where are these sinners found? In Zion. Again, this is not talking about the world. This is talking about God's people. This is, this is Jerusalem. This is the city of God. The Bible speaks of sinners in Zion being afraid when the Lord comes and shall not keep silent. 
and a fire devours before him. They are hypocrites. That is, they are actors. Too late they realize that God is not their bowling buddy whom they swap high fives with. They understand too late the purity and righteousness and holiness of God and the hatred that God looks upon sin with. The enormity of their sins comes up, rises up before him, and they quake in fear. They realize that the cloak which they have been taught covers their sins is as nothing before the penetrating eyes of God. It's a sad truth that not many are willing to make a covenant with God by sacrifice. They are not willing to sacrifice their love for this world that they might have Jesus. In the book of Luke, chapter 13, verse 23, the question is asked, Lord, are there few that be saved? In response to this question, Jesus exhorts, strive to enter in at the straight gate for many I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. And he adds in Matthew 7, 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Many shall not be able to enter in, few there be that find it. From the pen of inspiration we read, it is a solemn statement that I make to the church that not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history and would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sinner. So many have brought into the church their own unsubdued spirit, unrefined, their spiritual taste is perverted by their own immoral, debasing corruptions, symbolizing the world in spirit, in heart, in purpose, confirming themselves in lustful practices, and are full of deception through and through in their professed Christian lives, living as sinners, claiming to be Christians. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Every soul will have in judgment exactly the character of morals he cultivated in this life. Every soul will have in the judgment just such a spirit and character as he cherished in his home life in association with his neighbors and with members of his family. And according as he has appreciated the words of Christ and has obeyed them will be the judgment pronounced upon him by that man Jesus who came into the world and gave his life a sacrifice for him. I lay down my pen and lift up my soul in prayer that the Lord would breathe upon his backslidden people, which are his dry bones, that they may live. The end is near, steering upon us so stealthily, so imperceptibly, so noiselessly, like the muffled tread of the thief in the night, to surprise the sleepers off guard and on ready. May the Lord grant to bring his spirit upon hearts that are now at ease, that they may no longer sleep as others do, but watch and be sober. And from the fifth volume of the Testimonies, page 690, it says their taste has been so perverted that they would be inclined to criticize even the table of the Lord in his kingdom. What of you? Are the foods that you choose to eat preparing you to enjoy the Lord's table? And of course, this is talking about more than just food. Are the entertainments or the recreations you participate, are they preparing you for the holy recreation of heaven? Do the things you watch on television or in the theater, do the books you read or the music you listen to draw you closer to Jesus or to the world? Is your lifestyle such that you would be pleased to enjoy the simple and holy pleasures of God's kingdom? 
Or will the end steal upon you as a thief and catch you off guard and on ready? We read in the third, I'm sorry, the second epistle of Peter, chapter 3. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are, in the, that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Holy conversation or conduct and godliness. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. If the world and its works are going to be burned up, if all these things will be dissolved, what manner of people ought we to be in all, in all holy manner of living and godliness? Our works in our life should be not of this world, but of the world to come. The next verse says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. That's 2 Peter 3, 10 to 14. The world will be dissolved. But we, according to his promise, we look for a different world, a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And to dwell there, we must be righteous. Amen. Daniel 12, 2 says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. They that turn many to righteousness. And in order to turn many to righteousness, we must first ourselves be righteous. The time is coming when all the things in this world will be dissolved, and yet few are seeking to enter into the narrow way. There are many prophecies pointing to the condition, not of the world, but of God's own people, just before Christ comes again. They are all speaking of the time period just before the coming of Jesus. So they're not speaking of ancient Israel. They're speaking to us. They that turn many to righteousness. What about turning any to righteousness? Lord, are there few that be saved? The Bible teaches us three main powerful ideas that we need to understand. The first is, is the power, the creative power of God, the divinity of God. The second is the nearness or the humanity of our Savior. And the third thing is the absolute depravity of humans, of man, our absolute and utter helplessness. These things we need to understand. And we're going to look at a story that brings these things together and gives us hope. If you want to turn with me to 2 Kings 6, 2 Kings chapter 6. Second Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 1. And this is where the lesson comes in that we saw uh, just before, or at the start of the message. And the Bible says here in Second Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. That means it's getting crowded. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And Elisha answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. 
And Elisha answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? Where did it fall? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore, said he, take it up to thee, and he put out his hand, and he took it. So during the time of Elisha, there existed schools of the prophets. This is from Loma Linda Messages, uh, page 535. The school of the prophets was a special school to get the endowment of the Holy Spirit of God and then go forth into the dark places of the earth and seek for those who would listen to the testimony that they had to bring. And that sounds a lot like Daniel 12, 3, turning many to righteousness. And that's what we ought to seek in our education. That's what true education or higher education that Monique was presenting earlier in the week. This is what it's all about. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can go forth with the message of the gospel as medical missionaries, as, as, as gospel workers, to share the light of God. So these students, or these sons of the prophets as they were called, they were living at a, one of the particular schools uh, with Elisha. And due to increased enrollment, they needed to build additional living quarters. As they were cutting down trees for the building, a student's axe, axe head flew off as he was swinging it back. It flew off the handle and it plunged into the river Jordan, lost. And the young man cried out to Elisha saying that it wasn't his. It was borrowed. He couldn't replace it. Elisha, the man of God, asks the question, where did it fall? And then he cuts down a branch. And he casts it into the Jordan right at the place where the axe head fell. And by the power of God, the properties or the nature of the branch were imparted to the axe head. And the axe head floated to the surface as if it were a branch. The command was then given to take it up and it was plucked off the surface of the river Jordan. In Genesis 2.7, the Bible says that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. In Job 33, 4, the Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. You know, just like that axe head, our life is not our own. It's borrowed from the Creator. When Adam fell, we can hear the cry, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. I can't replace this. As a result of Adam's transgression, mankind has been plunged into the depths of sin. And just as it is the nature of the axe just as it's the nature of a rock, just as it is the nature of an axe to sink under the water, so it is in our very nature to commit sin, to fall into sin. It says in Ephesians 2, 3, among whom the children of disobedience also, we all had our conversation or our conduct in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. Amen. But praise God. Our loving Heavenly Father has asked, where did it fall? Where did they fall? 
And he took the branch, the righteous branch, Jesus Christ, and he sent him right to where we fell. Amen. Isaiah 11, 1 to 5, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. As Elisha cast the branch right where the axe head had fallen, Jesus came to us right where we had fallen. He took upon his divine nature, our fallen human nature. And through the union of this humanity, this fallen humanity with his divinity, Jesus imparts to us his divine nature. Through his connection with the Father, Jesus imparts to humanity properties that did not exist there before. Mm -hmm. Just like the properties or the nature of the branch were imparted to the axe head. The divine nature is imparted to us that we may rise above sin. Yes. Ellen White pens in the Desire of Ages, 311, 312, Christ is the ladder that Jacob saw, the base resting on the earth, and the topmost round reaching to the gate of heaven, to the very threshold of glory. If that ladder had failed by a single step of reaching the earth, we should have been lost. But Christ reaches us where we are. He took our nature and overcame that we, through taking his nature, might overcome. Amen. Made in the likeness of sinful flesh, he lived a sinless life, now by his divinity, he lays hold upon the throne of heaven, while by his humanity, he reaches us. Amen. He bids us by faith in him to attain to the glory of the character of God. Therefore, are we to be perfect, even as our Father which is in heaven is perfect. Amen. There's a passage in the New Testament that presents the same message as this Old Testament story that we found in 1 Kings chapter 6. And it's found in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Because of the shape, and because of the material of the axe head, the natural laws, that is the law of surface tension, the law of displacement, the law of gravity, could do nothing to make the axe head float. That is how you knew with a certainty that that rock would sink, because you knew the law. You knew the law. You knew these laws, maybe not all the intricacies of them, but you understood these laws. They could do nothing, these laws could do nothing to make the axe head float. But the fault is not, it was not with the laws, but it was because of the nature of the axe head. The laws, because of the nature of the axe head, they were weak or powerless in making that axe head float. In fact, the laws of nature could only make it sink. Amen. And so the same thing, it is with us. Because of the fall of Adam, we've inherited fallen natures. The law of God is unable to make us righteous. It is weak through the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest in all manner of sins, and the law cannot help us. In fact, it can only condemn us. And so what did God do? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
God sent Jesus where we fell. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He is the ladder that reaches all the way to this earth. And he is the branch that was cast in right where we fell. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Amen. Jesus did not sink when he came in sinful flesh, but rather he condemned sin in the flesh. And by coming to where we fell, he imparts to us the divine nature that we may no longer sink under sin, but float and be victorious. Amen. Just as the passage concludes, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The righteousness of the law fulfilled in us, not for us, but in us. Just as the axe head took upon itself the properties or the nature of the branch, tossed in where it fell, so Christ has come to give us his divine nature. By Christ coming to where we fell, he imparts to us his righteousness. And we, are to, and we are brought up out of the depths of sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. You know, we have been sinning our whole lives. We become familiar with it. We know sin. But he knew no sin. So to him, it was that much more repulsive. Sometimes it does not repulse us like we should because we're so used to it. But it repulsed him. And yet he was made to be sin for us. We are made in Jesus Christ what we are not apart from him. Still an axe head. The axe head didn't change. It was still an axe head. So still in sin sinful flesh, we are made to partake of the divine nature. And as a result, we may, we may walk without spot, without spot and blameless before our God. When we, when we as a people are partakers of the divine nature, partaking of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, rising above the Jordan River of sin and iniquity, then the word is spoken, as it was of the axe head, take them up to thee. Christ Object Lessons, page 69, when the fruit is brought forth, immediately, he does not wait. There's no pause here, no tarrying. When the fruit is brought forth immediately, he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come. Amen. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people. Then he will come to claim them as his own. Amen. You know, the quote that was used on the flyer here, Christian Service, page 238, the Lord bids you come up higher to reach a holier standard. You must have experience much deeper than you have yet even thought Amen. of having. You know, that's where knowledge comes in. Faith and knowledge and this. We need to understand this. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Amen. Satan's charge against God, <coughs> the cry of most of Christendom, is that God's law cannot be kept. But through the Lord, our righteousness, we as fallen axe heads will do that which axe heads cannot do of themselves. Amen. We will represent to the, to the world the power of God. We will represent to the world that through Jesus Christ, axe heads can float. 
And when this happens, the world will notice. This representation of the character of Jesus is what will turn many to righteousness. Ministry of Healing, page 180. The Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life that men might have no fear because of the weakness of human nature that they could not overcome. Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature. And his life declares that humanity, combined with divinity, does not commit sin. In the same epistle of Peter exhorting us to godly living, we read of a false gospel being presented in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, the second chapter. In chapter 2, Peter writes about false prophets coming in, bringing in doctrines that deny Jesus, leading its followers to live such lives that it caused the gospel to be evil spoken of. And toward the end of that chapter, Peter gives a warning. This is verse, starting in verse 19. While they promise them liberty, freedom in Jesus, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. That's 2 Peter 2, 19 to 22. That which has been purged out of the dog, it goes back to, to eat. <clears throat> and a pig, though washed, will go back to the dirt, wallowing in the mire, in the mud. Why? Because that's its nature. That is the very nature of the dog. That is the very nature of the pig. A gospel that does not present the need of complete transformation through partaking of the divine nature to rise above this sinful world, this sin, to, to rise above sin in this life, a gospel that does not present that will fall short of everlasting life. Its hearers will remain plunged in the depths of sin, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these promises ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We are not called to wash pigs. Our work is not merely to increase numbers and to rejoice in that increase. We are called to turn many to righteousness, Amen. to be partakers of the divine nature. But we ourselves must first become partakers. Amen. This is a longer quote. It's from Christ Object Lessons 311. Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This covering the robe of his own righteousness, Christ will put upon every repentant, believing soul. This robe, woven in the loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ, in his humanity, wrought out a perfect character. And this character he offers to impart to us. Everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins. And in Him is no sin. Amen. By His perfect obedience, He has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart 
is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into a captivity to him. We live his life. Galatians 2.20 This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then, as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. He who becomes a partaker of the divine nature will be in harmony with God's great standard of righteousness, his holy law. This is the rule by which God measures the actions of men. This will be the test of character in judgment. And that points to the midnight cry. The midnight cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. The hour of his judgment is come. We are living now in this time, this time of great test. Now there's an important point I want to bring out. One last point from, from uh, the story of Elisha. Second Kings Chapter 6, verse 3. It says, One said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. Elisha's name means God is our salvation, or God is salvation. What if that one had not asked Elisha to come with them? to go with them that day as they went to work. That axe head would have stayed sunken under the water. You know, that's an important lesson for us. Daily we need to ask God our salvation. Be content, O Lord, I pray thee. Go with thy servant today. The miracle in our lives happens before the day even gets started. It happens on our knees. The result of that experience will tell for the rest of the day. That's when you see, we'll see the axe heads floating. When situations arise in which axe heads, axe heads normally sink, because of the nature of the axe head. When situations arise that normally cause us to fall under it, fall under sin, we will float because Emmanuel, God, is with us. We have his nature imparted to us and we are bearing his image. So I hope that any time you look upon a tree, upon a flower, upon a rock, as you see these things in nature, you will think of the natural laws. You will think of the law of God. But most importantly, you will think of he who created these things and his divine nature, that he can recreate you. He can put in you the beauty of the flower. He, he can make you, he can transform you like he transforms the caterpillar into a butterfly. And so I, I just urge us, each one, as we start each day, to ask Jesus to go with us. We don't want to do this alone. We can't do this alone. And that is my prayer.